Hello everyone, this is our next chapter in our journey through metabolism and bioenergetics, BIS 103. This is lecture four and what we want to do today is to recap what we had learned last lecture and lecture three on glycolysis and then dive into some variations on this glycolytic theme and specifically we want to talk about ethanolic and lactate fermentation. So what do we do with breaking down sugars for energy when oxygen is not present. And in addition, we have a, a briefer chapter on the catabolism of other sugars. We have only looked at glucose so far, but we also can break down other sugar molecules. And I will cover this in a separate video. So learning goals for today and specifically for this video, again, we want to be able to explain the various pathways that use the core 10 glycolytic reactions that we learned about in the last lecture and we want to be able to distinguish and define aerobic glycolysis versus lactic acid and ethanolic fermentation and in addition we want to be able to describe the inputs or the substrates that are going into these pathways as well as the outputs the products again comparing aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis and the fermentation pathways So to recap glycolysis and what we had discussed in lecture three, here again is your glycolytic pathway. I deliberately took the structures out because I really want us to focus for this recap on the chemical logic of what is happening here and what do we want to achieve in our 10 steps of aerobic glycolysis. What we have done last lecture said we took glucose and our purpose was to break down glucose to release ATP, form ATP. Right? So in those 10 steps, we're breaking down glucose and our end product are two molecules of pyruvate. And in the process, we are generating ATP. Right? Let's go through it step by step one more time. Again, focusing on sort of the chemical reactions and the logic behind them and how can we achieve this. Right? So our first step here was the phosphorylation of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. That was a hexokinase reaction. Again, the kinase, an enzyme that catalyzes phosphorylation using ATP as the phosphoryl group donor. It was a bit counterintuitive to think about in the beginning, right? We said our goal of glycolysis is to produce ATP. And already in the first step, what we're actually using is we're using ATP to facilitate this phosphorylation of glucose. But we said it was important for us for several reasons. Right? It was activating glucose for further breakdown. It was making the molecule more polar to trap it within the cell for the purpose of glycolysis. And it was changing the concentration gradient of free glucose so that we can take up more glucose continuously to do glycolysis. Then our next step here was from glucose 6-phosphate in isomerization we had moved from an aldose to a ketose. Glucose 6-phosphate is an aldose. Fructose 6-phosphate is a corresponding ketose. What we have done is that we move the carbonyl function from the C1 to the C2 here in fructose 6-phosphate. The reason for it wasn't immediately clear. We're not releasing any energy <laughs> in this particular direction to make ATP. But we learned, right, as we're moving forward in the next steps of glycolysis, this isomerization was really critical to facilitate the next reactions. What is the next reaction now? We took fructose 6-phosphate after this isomerization, and we're catalyzing another kinase reaction, another phosphorylation. So equivalent to our first reaction here, we have another kinase reaction, again using one molecule of ATP, to convert fructose 6-phosphate in fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The phosphorylation now happens at C1. We already had phosphorylation at C6 here, now we have it at C1, which means we are generating a near symmetrical molecule. And we could do so because we had done this kettle isomerase reaction here, moving the carbonyl group from C1 to C2, which generated an alcohol at C1, and that could be phosphorylated. Right? So the isomerization here was important in order to generate a molecule that is almost symmetrical. 
Why was that important? It's important for the next step. Right? The next step is cleaving our molecule, right? We have our six carbon biphosphate sugar here, our fructose one six bisphosphate. Now we're doing an aldol cleavage. The enzyme is an aldolase and we are cleaving between C3 and C4. So from one six carbon molecule, we're generating two three carbon molecules. Right? Those two are dihydroxyacetone phosphate, DHAP, and glyceraldehyde three phosphate or GCP. Those two are, one is an aldehyde, or G3P here, one is a ketone or DHAP. Apart from that, these molecules are identical. And this was a second important reason of why this isomerization here in step two was so important, because now we can actually run the same kind of isomerization reaction. We can move the keto and the aldehyde function. We can actually convert DHAP, the ketone, into another molecule of G3P. So the outcome of these first reactions, two kinase reactions and two isomerizations, we can generate two molecules of G3P. So we have broken down our glucose into two three carbon molecules that are identical. This is what we call the priming phase. So we're just getting ready for the real meat of glycolysis, what we have done in terms of bioenergy, right? We have actually used two ATP to catalyze this conversion of one molecule of glucose into two molecules of G3P. Why is this important? Keep in mind, right? We now have two molecules, two molecules of G3P. So everything you see now in this next phase of glycolysis, which is our payoff phase, the next reactions happens twice because both molecules of G3P are being converted. Okay. The first step in this payoff phase now is the reaction of these two molecules of G3P, another phosphorylation that is happening here. But really important to note here is this now is not a phosphorylation that is utilizing ATP as the phosphoryl group donor. Okay. This is not a kinase reaction. This is actually a dehydrogenase. What we're doing here is that we're doing an oxidation of G3P and we're using the energy of this oxidation to bring about the phosphorylation at C, uh, the C1 of G3P. Important here, this dehydrogenase is dependent on NAD, our cofactor. If you sort of forgot about NAD, have a look at our breakout video from lecture three on the cofactor and NAD in its function. Right? We are oxidizing as a first step here, but if we have an oxidation reduction reaction, we have to reduce something else. And in this case, we are reducing our cofactor NAD to NADH. Through this oxidation reduction reaction, we are releasing energy, and that energy can be used to phosphorylate carbon one of G3P. We are generating two molecules of 1,3-bis-PGA. And we have said this molecule is actually our first high energy compound. If that doesn't ring a bell, there's another breakout video that I encourage you to watch from lecture three that speaks specifically about high energy compounds. Just in brief here, energy compounds are compounds that release a certain amount of bioenergy that can be used to facilitate other reactions that in themselves are not thermodynamically favorable and not fluxing from left to right as we wish. So now we have this high energy compound here and this is now really critical for our ability to produce ATP through glycolysis. Because what we're doing now is actually we're using another kinase, but this time we're running it in the direction of producing ATP. So we're actually cleaving off the phosphoryl group of 1,3-bis-PGA. This phosphoryl group within the enzyme will actually now be attached to ADP, adenosine dinitrate phosphate. So it's ATP just missing one phosphoryl group. We're generating ATP that now has gotten the phosphoryl group from 1,3-bis-PGA and we're releasing molecules of 3PGA. So dephosphorylation, a group transfer of a phosphoryl group from this high energy compound to ADP. We're making our first two molecules of ATP. 
because remember, right, we are going in here with two molecules of G3P, so everything times two. Now we have this sort of medium energy compound here. We want to actually make more ATP. How can we do this? We can actually help ourselves again by modifying this molecule in intramolecularly using an isomerization and a specific kind of isomerase here, mutate. What we're doing is that we're actually moving the phosphoryl group of 3PGA to carbon two. So simply within the molecule, we're just switching it one over. This doesn't release energy, much like we had discussed up here in our reaction two, but we are getting the molecule again ready for further modification that allows us to generate energy. In this particular case here, what we're using is an enolase. So what this is doing actually, it is dehydrating 2PGA. And that, if you look back into your lecture on the high energy compounds, if we do this, what we're actually generating is an enol, an alkene with a hydroxy group. And if this is phosphorylated, as it still is here for 2PGA, you have an enolic phosphate. And an enolic phosphate is another high energy compound. And in our case here, that is PEP. So this isomerization reaction helps us to actually bring about the conversion of 3PGA that has lost energy from 1,3-bis-PGA and transferred it to ATP to bring it back to a molecule, in this case PEP, that is another high energy compound. But we haven't used ATP to do so. Right? So now we have energy in this molecule and we can use it again We're using another kinase reaction here. In this case, it's a pyruvate kinase much like we have seen before here for this reaction, we are using now the breakdown of PEP, the dephosphorylation and the group transfer of the phosphor group to ADP. We are making another two molecules of ATP and we are releasing pyruvate as the final product of our aerobic glycolysis. All right. So this is a payout phase. What have we gained, right? We have used in our priming phase two ATP now, because we have broken down glucose into two molecules of G3P, done all of the payoff phase twice, and we have two of these ATP generating reactions, we actually have a net gain of two ATP from aerobic glycolysis. So here's the same in numbers, right? We have the priming phase here. We converted one molecule of glucose and two molecules of ATP into two molecules of G3P and two ADPs. And then in our payoff phase, we have these two molecules that are the product of our priming phase. We're bringing in our inorganic phosphate and NAD for the oxidation and phosphorylation step. We're bringing in ADP as a substrate. We're generating pyruvate as our product of glycolysis and we're generating four ATP and two NADH and some water. So some of the take home message that we said was, it's really critical in order for glycolysis to function continuously, we can never empty our tanks of ATP because right, you need some ATP to make more ATP later. This is really critical. Cells always must maintain a minimal concentration of ATP in order to produce more. And so this is so critical for living systems. We we'll look at it later how this is regulated. But this is sort of a major take home message here. A few other important things that I would like you to look at again from our last lecture and sort of keep in mind is this alpha and beta nomenclature and how this is relevant for how we can bring about this um, aldol reaction, the carbon carbon cleavage. You should be looking at your reactive group, your carbonyl groups, and as well as the role of nucleophiles and electrophiles from our last lecture. You should be aware of some of the enzymes and the cofactors. See our breakout video from lecture three on that. And same so for our breakout lecture on the high energy compounds and their functional groups that you should be aware of. Right, so now that we have recapped glycolysis and we're sort of familiar with these steps, we had asked ourselves in the last lecture, is this pathway complete? Have we done everything that we need to? Right? And our answer was a clear no. We had forgotten about something, right? And what we had forgotten about is our cofactor. Right? What we had done broadly was, right, conversion of glucose to pyruvate, and we had made ATP. Okay? So that's one thing. 
what do we do with ATP? We don't want to run out of ADP either. It's our substrate for making ATP. And what I can tell you sort of at this stage is there's a whole number of cellular processes that will go through this quarter that we generate ADP from ATP. Basically, whenever you do biochemical work, you're using up your ATP, you regenerate ADP. But another important part was our cofactor, right? We also, in reaction six of glycolysis, had converted our oxidized cofactor NAD into two molecules of the reduced cofactor equivalent NADH plus H plus. And we need to recycle this, right? This is absolutely critical because if you don't do this, you are running out of your oxidized cofactor, you cannot do glycolysis. And if you look back, there was no reaction in our 10 steps of aerobic glycolysis that converted NADH back to its oxidized form. So we have to have another means of recycling this to continue glycolysis. And so the question now becomes, how do we do this? First question we could ask is, well, how fast is it actually happening? Is, is there so much energy that we shouldn't be worrying about? How fast is this actually used up? And so one example that I want to show you here is in skeletal muscle. So your skeletal muscle is using glycolysis is using ATP just for you to move around. And what people have measured is that in skeletal muscle, we have a concentration and a turnover of about 50 micromole of glucose per minute per gram fresh weight of muscle tissue. Right? Because, right, glucose breakdown, we need two molecules of NAD for each of these reactions. We'll have a need of a hundred and 100 micromole NAD per minute per gram fresh weight, right? So this is our breakdown. How much NAD do we actually have in this tissue? You can measure this and our concentration of NAD plus in muscle tissue is actually only 0.06 micromole per gram fresh weight. So the answer to the question, how fast we turn it over, very, very fast. So in something like 0.04 seconds, you would be running out of NAD as your cofactor if you're not recycling it. So this should highlight to you how important it is and how limited our pool of NAD, NAD plus actually is for the need to recycle. So this is what we call the cofactor issue. We'll come back to this over and over again this quarter and we'll see how important it is, not just for NAD, but for the majority of our cofactors to constantly recycle this. So the key part of today's lecture will be, how can we do this? How do we recycle this? Good thing is, if, if we actually have presence of oxygen, again, we're using our cellular processes to do so, right? So I just show this to you here in very general terms. We'll go through it in detail throughout the next lectures. What I can tell you now is that we can recycle NADH and we oxidize it using a number of different reduced and oxidized carriers. And eventually we're actually using our electron transport chain here with H2O and with oxygen as a final carriers. What is important now is what do we get out of this, right? If we do all these cellular processes, what we've put in is one glucose, right? What we get out is two pyruvates and our net ATP yield from aerobic glycolysis initially is two ATP. What I will show you later though too is that we actually get more ATP out of it through our cellular processes. So our released NADH, the recycling of NADH actually releases additional ATP, which we'll see later. It will release about five ATP, so our total yield of ATP under aerobic conditions would be seven ATP. What happens if we run out of oxygen? What about organisms that don't work on oxygen? Right? In this case, if we are lacking oxygen, fermentation kicks in. Right? And so this is what I want to talk to you about today is how can we deal with um, the recycling of our NADH cofactor under the lack of oxygen. So fermentation. There are many different forms of fermentation. I will only touch on the two major ones. The first one that I want to talk about is lactic acid or lactate fermentation. 
So all of our athletes should be paying close attention here. Right? So what I show you here is lactate fermentation. What I want you to keep in mind is, right, lactate fermentation is not just one reaction. It always needs to include the first 10 steps of glycolysis. Right? Without the production of pyruvate through glycolysis, there is no lactic acid fermentation. So for the purpose of an exam and, and future studies, keep in mind, lactate fermentation are the first 10 steps of glycolysis plus one more. And this one more step is another dehydrogenase reaction here. In this case, it's a lactate dehydrogenase. What does this do? It's actually taking pyruvate here, our product of glycolysis. It will take a reduced NAD cofactor, NADH plus H plus, right, that we got from our reaction six of glycolysis. And what it does here now, it's actually reducing the carbonyl group of pyruvate here at the C2, and it's generating lactate. Okay, lactic acid, here's your acid function. The only difference to pyruvate now is that you don't have a carbonyl function. You have a hydroxy group at this position. And then in this process, right, the reduction, the electrons for doing so, for reducing this carbonyl group, come from NADH. In the process, you are reoxidizing your cofactor to NAD+, recycling achieved. Okay. This is energetically a very ferrule reaction. It has a negative standard Gibbs free energy here. And you can also see here from the errors, right? It fluxes primarily in this reaction, but it's not entirely irreversible. This dehydrogenase under certain conditions can flux to some degree also in the direction of pyruvate. But for the most part, this will do the reduction of pyruvate. Okay. So we have achieved our um, recycling of the cofactor, right? If we do this, again, we want to do our ins and outs. Same is true, we've done glycolysis, so our in again is one glucose. Our out now is two molecules of lactate, right? Keep in mind, glycolytic product are two molecules of pyruvate. Our ATP yield now is two ATP per glucose because this actually does not go through the cellular processes that I mentioned when oxygen is present. So all we get under these circumstances is two ATP per glucose. Lactic acid formation actually happening under a number of different circumstances and tissues. You're probably most familiar with, right, under sports condition, if you go for a long run, if your muscles run out of oxygen, you start to do lactic acid fermentation. Right? And that's also part of you getting sore muscles. The other part is sort of microfiber ribs in your muscles, but also the formation of lactate in your muscles, and if your muscles are depreciated of oxygen. Okay. Another prominent example are red blood cells, erythrocytes. They actually do only lactate fermentation. The reason here is that mature red blood cells do not actually have mitochondria. They kick out their mitochondria. They only do lactate fermentation. It is not entirely understood why that is, but one strong hypothesis is that using these cellular processes also creates oxidative stress to some degree, and red blood cells are extremely sensitive to oxidative stress. So it might be that they prefer to do lactate fermentation to prevent that from happening. Another example is your breakfast here. Lactic acid fermentation also happens, for example, in your yogurt cultures. So bacteria such as lactobacillus actually using lactic fermentation and so developing your breakfast yogurt cultures also uses this type of fermentation. All right, this is lactic fermentation. What's our next one? Alcoholic fermentation or ethanolic fermentation. So all your brewers and bakers um, among you should pay really close attention to this one. Another major form of fermentation is using production of ethanol. Now, how this works? Again, we come in right with glycolysis. We're producing our two molecules of pyruvate. Unlike lactic acid fermentation, we actually have two reactions here. The first one is a decarboxylation. That's a reaction we haven't really been exposed to yet, right? What we're actually doing here simply now is that we are removing 
the carbon dioxide, so the acid function here from pyruvate, that's a decarboxylation removal of this carboxylic group here. And what we're generating is acid aldehyde. So a very short, simple aldehyde here. The enzyme name you want to remember, it's a pyruvate decarboxylase. It's a decarboxylation reaction or for short PDC. It requires a couple of cofactors, including magnesium and TPP. Hold your suspense a little bit. We'll get into TPP a little bit later. For now, just remember that the pyruvate decarboxylase does require TPP as a cofactor. Okay. So now we have an aldehyde here, that's fine, right? but we haven't done any cofactor recycling yet. Right? So this comes in the next step. We are helping ourselves by using another dehydrogenase. In this case, it's called the alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH. Okay. Now, what happens here is similar to what we've seen before, is we're reducing the carbonyl group to an alcohol. What we're generating is ethanol. Okay. Same procedure here, we're reducing the carbonyl group here to an alcohol. The electrons for this to happen come from oxidizing our NADH cofactor from glycolysis into its oxidized form NAD, cofactor recycling achieved. What we made is alcohol ethanol. Okay. What are our ins and outs? They're actually exactly the same as for lactic acid fermentation. We have an in of our glucose. Instead of lactate, we're producing two molecules of ethanol and two molecules of carbon dioxide. And our ATP yield is just the same, two ATP per glucose. Where is this happening, right? I already alluded to brewers and the bakers. So many microbes do this, especially yeasts do this, right? If you think about beer brewing or doing baking with yeast, if you see the dough rising and all the bubbles in the beer that you see here in the background of today's lecture, that's the release of carbon dioxide in this process of ethanolic fermentation. This is where the bubbles come from. It's the release of carbon dioxide in this process while the yeast microbe are making ethanol. Also, some other tissues such as plant roots um, make actually actually fermentation, especially submerged plants that are deprived of oxygen. Okay. One really important aspect for us humans is we actually do not have the PDC. We do not have the pyruvate decarboxylase. So we are not capable of doing ethanolic fermentation. I would argue that's probably a blessing in disguise because right, if we were to have this enzyme, all we would have to do is, is to hold our breath and suddenly we could make our own alcohol in our own bodies. Probably a good thing that we can't. So these are the two major forms of fermentation. There are many more. So I showed you the lactic acid fermentation here. I showed you the ethanolic fermentation. There are many others. There can be propionic acid fermentation, some other alcoholic fermentations, but also acetic acid fermentation can occur. What I show you here is that we can use this also industrially. Right? Lactic acid fermentation is used for making cheese, yogurt, soy sauce, and so forth. Ethanolic fermentation is used industrially everywhere to make wine, beer, and so forth. Um, some other forms, right, your nail polish, rubbing alcohol is actually made by using large fermenters, hundreds of thousands of liters fermenters, using microbes to produce your nail polish remover, right? Similar for acetic acid, so your salad dressing, that's done in massive fermenters using microbial fermentation. Right? This can also be used for other compounds such as biofuels, pharmaceuticals, right? In lecture one, I gave you this one example of this antimalaria drug, artemisinin, that is made in microbes. And so they're using simply fermentation here to produce these kinds of compounds. In this case here, this company is using yeast and alcoholic fermentation to bring about the production of these pharmaceuticals. So all the microbiology majors of you, you will have a field day throughout your studies to go through all these fantastic different kinds of fermentations, how they can be used industrially. All right, so now we've accomplished fermentation. We have recycled our cofactor. 
one aspect that I want to highlight here though is what to do with alcohol, right? While we cannot make it ourselves, we can consume it. Um, it also actually is produced, for example, by intestinal microbes in your gut. So we want to have the capacity to deal with it. We want to have the capacity to break down alcohol. Right? So how do we do this? Right? So ethanolic or alcohol metabolism. Right? So say it's Friday night, you drank too much, or your intestinal microbes were particularly active and produced a lot of ethanol in your system now. You want to deal with this, how can we do it? So we're using ethanol as an example here, right here. And the first step that we're doing is we're using our ADH enzyme again. Right? We just used it in ethanolic fermentation, but this enzyme being an oxidation reduction reaction, right? It's a dehydrogenase, it's fully reversible, so it can also go in the other direction. And so what we're doing now is actually we're oxidizing ethanol back to acid aldehyde. Okay. What we're doing, right, we're oxidizing, so we have to reduce something. We are actually reducing NAD+, plus, our oxidized cofactor, to NADH. Right. Now we have acetaldehyde. Next step, there's two more to go. Another reversible dehydrogenase reaction. In this case, it's called the ALDH. And just remember the acronym here. Again, we're doing another oxidation now from the aldehyde function here to a carboxyl group. So we're generating an acid. We're actually generating acetic acid here. Same problem, right? We have an oxidation happening. We need to reduce. And again, we're helping us by using NAD plus and reducing it as a cofactor to bring about this oxidation reduction reaction. Now, acetic acid is an acid. You don't really want to accumulate it at large amounts, so you want to break this down further. And the way we do this is that we actually convert it into a molecule called acetyl-CoA. We'll see acetyl-CoA a lot throughout the quarter. It's actually one of our major metabolites to transfer energy in energy metabolism. We'll see it a lot in when we talk about the TCA cycle. And this is a reaction now that costs a lot of money, right, to bring about the removal of the carboxy group and instead add a thioester and a CoA enzyme, another um, cofactor, coenzyme A, that we'll be acquainted with in a little bit of time. Hold your suspense, we'll talk about this in more detail. Here, just want to focus on this particular pathway. And in order to bring this reaction about, we actually need to use ATP and not just a simple dephosphorylation of ATP to ADP. In this case, we actually have to hydrolyze both of our phosphoanhydride groups, so the energy-rich phosphoanhydride groups, to do it and convert it into AMP directly. So this is a very costly reaction, but it helps us because acetyl-CoA is an important metabolite in energy metabolizing. We can use it for generating energy. So this we can use unlike acetic acid. So even though this is a very costly reaction, it's very important to bring about the breakdown of ethanol into a molecule that we can actually use in energy metabolism. Now, if you look at this pathway, you should be shouting, here's a problem, right? Because there's no cofactor balance, right? The ethanol breakdown really is costly to us, not just for ATP, but because we have absolutely no cofactor balance here. Right? Keep that in mind for your next Friday night party. If you have to break down all this alcohol, you have a real cofactor problem. Right? You have to work very hard to recycle your cofactors through other processes. The other issue is right, if we have too much ethanol in our system, this pathway is not particularly efficient, in part because of our cofactor recycling issue. And so if you start to accumulate acid aldehyde, this is actually what cause, causes the nausea. This is what causes your, your headache and your hangover. Right? Acid aldehyde is a very small molecule. It actually can go across the blood-brain barrier and is causing all of these issues. It's actually toxic to our system. Another effect that it has is actually the flushing. It causes vasodilation. So all of you who experience sort of if you drink a little bit too much, you start to flush and, and get red. This is actually accumulation of acetaldehyde. 
And the reason for this happening is that we have a lot of genetic diversity in this enzyme here. So there are specific mutations that have been discovered that are often specific to certain demographics and cause the enzyme to be less efficient. So if you have this vasodilation happening, it simply means that you are among a group that has an enzyme that is just a little less efficient. So you're breaking down acid and aldehyde a little bit slower. We can use this knowledge, right? This is not all bad, all about having drunk too much, but we can actually, the knowledge of this pathway can be used and has been used to develop drugs, right? The knowledge of this function here, the dehydrogenase here has been used for a drug and similar drugs is just one example called antabuse. And so this inhibits this dehydrogenase. If you inhibit this, right, what you do is you cause a drastic accumulation of acid aldehyde. So if you take this drug and you drink too much, you will get really sick, you will have strong hangovers, strong headaches, you get very nauseous. And so it's used to help, for example, alcoholics, right? If by yourself you just don't have the strength to stop drinking, you can take this drug. And it's a bit of a, a dramatic way of doing it because you get so nauseous from it, but it is supposed to help you to stop drinking, right? So again, this is one example on how we can use the knowledge of biochemistry to develop treatments and, and help for certain types of, of issues. All right, so this concludes our discussion on fermentation and our recap of glycolysis. As a last slide here, I have sort of a little bit of a no list slide. These are the enzyme names and reactions that I would ask you to know for this quarter. So the ones that I've highlighted in red here are the ones where I would ask you to know the specific name and the reaction. The ones that I have highlighted in blue, I would only ask you to know the general reaction. So for example, and I summarize, what does it do? Okay. Um, I do not ask you to know all these specific names here. If you know these trivial names here, that is perfectly fine. Okay. All right, this is for our lecture on fermentation. I'll hopefully see you in the next one on utilizing different kinds of sugar.